and uh, one of the treads is falling. You should have to fix it. He goes, oh, I'll have a welding guy go out there and look at this. So the welding guy would go out there and he says, well, I can fix some of those problems and I can fix it correctly. I can change all the fasteners and do that. How much do I want to fix that five-story behemoth with stairs and a cantilever at the bottom? Well, that's a pain he got. He wants 25000 So he's got Stu's violation. Said, What's it say on there? Scrape it and paint it. And he's got two quotes. Paint Joe Painter, Billy Bob Ironworker. And he says, okay, guess who gets awarded the contract for the past 50 to 75 years? Okay. The painter, now if everyone looks in front of them, Got a little piece of iron all over there. The painter sees that. So he plays you know, with two, two things that he uses. He uses you know, the Rustolian paint right out of Home Depot. And he uses black caulking. What do you think he uses the black caulking for? To play hide and seek. So he hides all the rust that you see in these connections. Then he paints over it. And he charges the guy $3,000. That's been going on for over 50 years. So in the first class we taught 10 years ago, we, the first word you can never write on a violation is scrape and paint. You write on your violation, examine it, repair it, test it. And that's why you have to write on a violation. It doesn't matter what you see. So today we're going to talk about what you're supposed to see if you're an examiner. Look, you know, walking underneath the fire escape. You look up, you're going to have enough information from looking up. And we videotaped a lot of this the last time we had classes we did downtown walk around with a similar group. So I don't know if that's one you schedule for this after this class ends. Yeah, that's still a flexible open. If anybody wants to we do a downtown walk around, we just videotape it and you just walk underneath the fire skips, you look up as an inspector and say, did it pass the visual inspection? Does it have any evidence of maintenance or does it have original hardware? Square head bolts and rivets. So we'll show you what that looks like. Forget about finding rust because who who who's been hiding that for you? The painter. So you're never gonna see that. But if, if you have a fire escape that's never been painted and they painted a nice beige or a nice white, what are you going to see? You're going to see all this rust. Because a year after they painted it, it shows first. <clears throat> the rust, all the rust pieces. Got it? So as, they, as we talk, if you guys want to walk around and, and pass it around and then we'll start the class, this is really about showing you what is and what isn't. And, and that way you can understand why everybody, and then start off with the first thing that uh, everybody with the gray hair is teach the guys coming in to fight fires with the dark hair still for a little while. In case of fire, never use the... No. <laughs> come up. It's not supposed to be told to everybody, no. But every firefighter tells the new firefighters to come in. In case of fire, never use the... Because it's unsafe. Got it? Now, this is back to when fire escapes were safe. Can anybody tell by the hats what years that was? No, because New York still uses those forever. Hats. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> they actually went up for uh, a few years and then they came up with an OSHA compliant harness, so New York got them back. They were really ticked that the leather helmets went off. But uh, yeah, that's probably uh, pre 50s. Perfect. So, all fire escapes in the U.S. were built in the late 1800s and then they were all built, and I mean hundreds of factories were pumping these things out in the 1900s to 1930s, 1940s. That's it. Once they finished building every one of those fire escapes, guess what happened to all those fire escape companies? They all went out of business. There isn't one fire escape company in the nation today. I own a fire escape company, and I only do fire escapes, so I'm the only fire escape company in the nation. But that's the problem. There's only one. Are we building new ones? Nobody's, bu nobody's building new ones. We, we actually have in Portland, because we're in the city of Portland. But <laughs> Actually, it was a bad result. Somebody decided to take one off without a permit. Yeah. They got caught, so they got to build a brand new one. No, they, you do build and it. Was, it was very difficult uh, for the contractor with building it to make it work the way it should have as opposed to the way they drew it up. So before we go too much further, though, there's an attendance sheet going around. Please put down your name, phone number, and email. That will let us get back to you with further details if anything else goes up from this. Um, this is Cisco Vanessa. He's uh, from Firescape Inspection Services, uh, and I'm Stu White, Senior Inspector with Portland Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, I took a phone call earlier this morning upstairs. They were looking for a retired guy by the name of Stu. One of my customers from about 15 years ago was absolutely sure that I would retire by now. So was I back then, but 
Yeah, so I'm still here. Paul, we got go around the room, introduce yourselves. Paul Jenny, fire marks is office. District inspector. Joe Harkness, same. Karen Shepard with Carlson Testing. We load test the fire escapes. Uh, I'm Tim Seuss with Carlson Testing as well. Bob, FX, repair and model. We do the testing, painting, repairs, rehabs, rebuilds, and we build new components. Doesn't take a factory. <laughs> uh, Sean Stoneberg with Stability Engineering. We analyze the fire escapes and sample them and make sure they're approved by the city and signed off on. So. Andy Rowe, me consulting. We buy as with Stu and the building department. Primarily the building department, so. Yeah. <laughs> Tim Terrich for like engineering, structural repairs. John Verona, fire inspector, the city of Mike Warren, fire marshal's office. Brad Watkins, also. <coughs> Wendy Fulmoni, fire marshal's office. Mark Gale, fire marshal's office. And Rob Bell, fire marshal's office. <laughs> Shepard, at that moment. Greg Shea from 11 Engineering and Design. Yeah, uh, Dave Carter from 11 Engineering. Perfect. So we got engineers here that do, they, there's a lot of questions that everybody's going to want here or know. If anybody's missing the book, I want to. If you want to pass this down to anybody? Should we yes. should everybody have a book? Everybody has a book down there? Yeah. I've got a couple right there, so. Perfect. So open, this is open-ended, so I want, I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, things that are going on. And uh, just so you know, it's been at Firescape Activity in Portland, Corvallis, Eugene. And some, some are pretty simple activities. Some are very complex activities. So we're going to share all that information here. Talk about California and there. Uh, load testing activity, we're going to talk about Massachusetts and their load testing activity, and we're going to talk about other states that I haven't seen any activity in, the, in load testing. So I only got two states that are, that are three states actually now, that are doing anything or testing, but today's class is really about what is load testing, what is refurbishment, so we're going to go into code a little bit, but at any time, agree, disagree, you don't have to understand what I'm saying, you just have to uh, sort of try to absorb it, and there's people here. If there's a question about what the Portland Fire wants, it's going to come here. If there's a question regarding load testing, well, we have enough engineers in here that they have to agree with each other, and we have enough, uh, we have vendors here that are prepared, and we have pieces of steel running, running around, so you guys can understand just what is hidden be beneath the, the naked eye. Right? So let's get rock and rolling on this. Uh, let's see if we... Uh, but the, the point that I wanted to make, somebody brought up the point earlier today, she said, um, I don't know if you want to shut up one more, I'd like to see if uh, we do this one, I think. Okay. I like these light switches. Is that, is that better for everybody? Okay. So uh, she asked, well, they've changed the rules in regards to load testing, that the rules used to be 100 pounds per square foot. These were built 100 years ago to 100 pounds per square foot, so nothing really has changed. But now they're saying here in Portland they want 200 pounds per square foot. So we'll bring that up when the load testing part of it comes, okay? So that was one of the questions that, that she asked, she wants that answer today. Anybody else have any other general question that they think should be answered today? Anybody? You mentioned something about taking away a fire escape. So if you want to take away a fire escape, there's a requirement. You still need to have a second means of egress, most likely internally, right? Yeah, two, so, two code compliant means of egress, and 99% of those are going to occur inside the building envelope. There are a couple of buildings out there that actually own the property that their fire escape hangs over. They stand a chance of being able to put an exterior stairway in and not losing a usable footage. So there's something that's going to be answered to any other question, general questions that we're going to answer throughout. And how long is the class for? Uh, we've actually got the room for three hours. Okay, so any other general questions that anybody wants to have? Otherwise, we'll just get started? All right, so. If you look at a, a typical fire escape, let's, let's say one of those platforms is five by five. Each fireman is going to weigh 200 pounds with 100 pounds of, uh, of weight on his as, 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 uh, equipment. 300 pound guy. If you put five 300 pound guys, you got 1,500 pounds. In a five by five, right, it can take up to, it's five times five is 25, times 100 pounds per square foot is 2,500 pounds. When that was built in 100 years ago, 50 years ago, it was built to take 2,500 pounds. Now you got five guys all with their uniforms on and all with their, uh, their equipment on, and can you squeeze five guys with full equipment into a five by five? Only if they're skinny. Take the residents in the building and you get five by five square, and you take 10 people all that weigh 150 pounds. 
That's only 1,500 pounds. Can you get 10 people to wait on a balcony for you? Not unless, you know, a couple of people on the, on the shoulders. So it's overbuilt. So you know why these guys are safe? Because that was only 25 years after the thing was built. And none of this has happened yet. There's a piece of rust there that uh, uh, somebody has on their table. A quarter inch of rust will grow to one inch of, uh, a quarter inch of steel will grow to one inch of rust. Does anybody have that full around? Somewhere on the table. Close. There it is. See that chunk? That chunk of, of that's what, what quarter inch of steel, you leave it alone, you just let it keep on growing, it'll grow to one inch of rust. And rust jacking and ice jacking is what tears buildings apart. So you got rust jacking between two pieces of steel, what's it do? And you got other pieces floating around. What's it doing to the two pieces of steel that used to be together? And the bolts that's inside there, if anybody has some little bolts going on, the outside shafts are nice and thick, they're quarters or three eighths. What's inside? Next to nothing. Next to nothing. So that's what's happening with a lot of guys that are out there, is that they're worried about that nothing, and that's what load testing is about. Now, let's talk about briefly, and then we'll just jump into this. Can you load test something that you can visibly see rust in the connection? No. So you've got to pass a confidence test before you can fully load test the fire escape. So you just don't load test any fire escape when you've got visible evidence. This is what happened uh, in, uh, anybody remember the station night fire? So this happened in 2003. It's been 10 years. And this is what, she called us asking about questions about fire escape and, and can people get out. So this is the story that she came up with. The smoke complains at the frightened faces. All in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. But the fire escape that broke underneath him. unsafe fire escapes, rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken, and what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So over here, for months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, and apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape. Right. And the bottom line? It'll get weakened in the measure of fall. This one has rotted connections. This one, missing bolts, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody in the, in the cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files. But there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this one Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. four more fire escapes. Do it all the facts? Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. How can they get away with that? I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No, but when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said it's a cold day in hell when that happens. In Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, 
Not one WeChat was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation. You don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Ellaby Ryan. So that was supposed to be a one minute piece. She ended up doing a five minute piece. And if you take a look at your book, look on the back. This is uh, what occurred in Boston 30 years prior to this news piece. So 30 years prior to that, uh, a a reporter caught uh, this photograph, and that was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. So the fireman saved himself with one hand, survived, still alive today. The woman died. The child, which was her niece, survived by landing on her. But look at all the fire escape pieces coming down on That was four stories in an area that's uh, Marlboro Street, which is uh, in Back Bay, which is, you know, it's a million dollar properties that's all up, in that, up and around there. So it usually takes a catastrophe, and that's what happened there. Prior to that, we had a building code that says you must maintain your fire escape at all times, which means what? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if you ain't right in violation, like I was in a room just uh, three months ago, I was in Philadelphia, 50 building inspectors in the city of Philadelphia continually had class just like this. I said, uh, can everybody, anybody raise their hand the last time they wrote a violation in the past month? Nobody. So in the past year, you wrote a violation on the fire escape? Nobody. Why is that? I did the same thing in Washington, D.C. And what's the, the reason? A lot of times, if you don't know how to cure the violation, what do you stop writing? The violation. The, right, the violation. Because if it's so complicated for the owner to get, resolve it, if, if all of a sudden the owner making phone calls can't get it, he has to call the original guy who wrote the violation, help me cure this violation you wrote, the guy goes, I, I don't know what to do. That's when everything gets confusing. And then what one guy does on one side of the street is different than what the other guy's doing across the street, it just creates you know, one guy's got sandbags hanging from the fire escape, the other one's got just a paint job, and both of them have their violations removed. So there was no standardization. And this went all the way up from Seattle down to San Diego. This is everywhere. So this is why they changed the code. So they added into this code the five-year rule. So now you must prove that the fire escape, and it says right on the code there, it says must be examined by a design professional and or others acceptable to the building official and a certification affidavit must be submitted. So it wasn't until that five-year rule. So then, you know, they started doing it for a while, then all of a sudden, 30 years later, what happened? Channel 5, saying what? It went to sleep again. So these things go to sleep if they're not automatics. Will sprinkler systems go to sleep anymore? They're locked in forever? Alarms? You know? Uh, so the same thing's gonna have to happen to fire escapes. It's your second means of egress. So, what they did here on Channel 5, Boston did a couple of things. In the building permit process, you can't sign off a permit unless it has a current certificate. So it doesn't trigger an inspection report. It's part of the closing of a permit is do you have a current certificate. So whether you're doing a light bulb or plumbing or a roof, they've made it so that anybody spending money on a building, that was triggering an automatic trigger. Okay? You can speak with, and I know there's certain codes, procedures, you have the final sign-off to occupy this room is what? There's a smoke, right? A smoke, in, uh, a smoke inspection, right? At residential and commercial. What do you ask for if it, became, if it becomes part of your checklist item? Are you ordering an inspection or are you asking for a copy of the five-year certification? Just a copy. Just a copy. If they don't have one, do you stop from filling out the, the smoke detector? No, they passed. But what now, who gets notified that they don't have a, 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 an occupancy? I mean, they don't have a current certificate. So the 30, 60, day, 90 day process. So that's two things you can do right now to make it part of the system, to start becoming a part of Permits signed off, not, not applying for them, but signing off of them must have a current certificate copy. 
And if you're doing the final sign off as far as the smoke, have a checklist item that just says, I need a copy of your certification. Because when the smoke goes off and you're in the bedroom, where do you, where do you go? The fire escape. The fire escape, okay? So let's talk about the code. So it took this tragedy, right, to basically have Boston write the five-year rule. Did we have a five-year rule here in Portland? Did we since, have a five-year rule this year? Since about uh, 2000, we had the five-year rule. The five-year rule. Yeah. You know what just came in on the IFC of 2012? When are you guys adopting the? the when are you guys adopting it? Uh, if we're lucky, it will be April first this next year. IFC 2012 says what now? Five year. Five year rule nationwide. So was it as a result of all the stuff we've been doing and pushing nationwide? We don't know. But you know what? It's now part of the IFC 2012. Where it is? It, where is it in the IBC? It's not. They took it out. <laughs> so now, guess who's holding the whole ball? As of 2012, and by the time you adopt it in 2015, 2018, everything's back to the fire department for the for the examination. So uh, it's on the chapter 11. If anybody wants to look it up, okay? In Portland, who holds the certificate? As far as a copy of it or records, it shall, in, under the current program, since we now have the permit process going through Bureau of Development Services. They will end up with a copy of the affidavit and it should go to microfilm in their system. It's also going into our system and being entered into the computer system itself. We actually scan it and attach it as well as entering the data in other locations. Yep. And that's uh, that's one of the protocol steps that I think needs to be refined for our system right now because that's probably one of those last pieces. And there will be more on that as we get into it, what we're doing with it right now for the final steps. Let's talk about the codes that are out there. They basically all stay the same. So I just ended this very quickly um, yesterday, but basically the International Fire Code for 2012 looks very similar to the International Building Code. Testing and certification, the fire escape shall be examined or tested by a design professional or others acceptable to the building official. So if there's a program like that in California and Massachusetts where you can examine fire escapes and, you have, and there's a certification or a license, there's only two. Massachusetts and, and, and LA has a certification program. Those people can examine fire escapes and submit a report to the official every five years. The current international fire code in a lot of, a lot of states have the, the same, uh, if uh, any fire escape system is found to be in a state of deterioration or unsafe, shall be, be repaired immediately. The wording that they used to have before that, before everybody starts adopting 2012 is this. It says, depending upon the structural condition, a load test shall be conducted. Depending on the structural condition, a low test must be uh, a low test may shall be conducted. Meaning, who has the decision to order the low test? So you give him any evidence of the structural condition, there may be no low test. That's what the rest of the country is doing. So let me explain that. Let's go to the next one. The NFPA. Uh, the authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any existing fire escape set that has been shown by low test or other evidence to have adequate strength. What's that mean? There's an either or here? Does anybody know that? That you can either low test a fire escape or you can provide the city official with other evidence of strength and what can they do for that low test? Am I right on this? Sir? So you can provide other, we're going to talk about other evidence of strength, what that means today. The International Building Code says today, and, and by the way, it's gone out. 2012, I, I was in there, I was actually in Atlantic City for the ICC, and I bought all the nice thick books that they have down there. I was down there, didn't stay for the week, but just came in for the day. I was actually at a round table meeting. And out of all the, you know, the round table is about 10 people get together, you just shop talk. Who shows up at my, uh, at my table? Corvallis, saying, oh, we need this. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody knows Jim Patton down there. He's the one that's, that was dealing with kind of how I met his boss, Mike, there. It was kind of a strange place saying, dude, we we're coming out and I invited them. You have enough, they came, but they were supposed to be here. But look, in Boston, it says, it says this. Testing and certification. All exterior fire escape systems shall be examined, which is the initial examination, the confidence test, proving that there's no rust in any connection and you verify the walls. Uh, uh, examined or tested and or certified for structural adequacy. What's that mean? There's an and or here too. So the building code, the NFPA, and the fire code, the existing, all three existing basically say what? There's an either or. 
There's a low test or a, of a strength. So if you leave behind, which is what we're going to show you today, that's the national model, you leave behind an original rivet and an original square head bolt that's 50 to 75 years old in great looking condition, no rust in it, can you give me any guarantee as an engineer? After you load test it, what can you write me? So that's not a guarantee, that's an assurance that you said the law says I can test this and that's all you're going to get from me because you know what these guys have and everybody has? The longest disclaimer letter of liability. And the disclaimer letter of liability in Boston already states it for you on the actual legal certificate from the city. It says, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, this fire escape is in conformity with the mass building code. Does that mean to you firefighters, you know, squirting water into a window? Use the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? So that there's been an abuse because there is a disclaimer. So they, they said low test it. So if I, if, I, if I take a fire escape and you low test it, and then two, two years later it collapses to the ground, whose fault is it? Well, that's an investigation, right? They're going to find out what occurred, but did you low test it as the law says? Now, I got a million dollar, a million dollar case here that I want to show you guys. And it's, and it's really focused not on, really on bolts, it's really focused on welding, welds, because you guys are going to have a different, a different uh, uh, take on wells from now on. I'm going to show you a million dollar well today. Okay? So, um, so it basically says what the NFPA says the best. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other, other satisfactory evidence to have adequate strength. What's that mean? What the nation is doing, and again we teach an entire, we teach the, uh, the, uh, in New Jersey through, uh, it was originally through Kane University, now it's through Rutgers, the entire fire prevention. So uh, believe it or not, the, the the state that's doing the most on the, on the East Coast is New Jersey. The state that's doing the most over here is Portland. It didn't happen overnight, guys. I mean, we've had a lot of head, head banging that's been going on all this time. But this is the, this is the most advanced uh, uh, attack on fire escapes is here in Portland. This is my sixth class. And every time we teach, there's always something a little bit different and something a little bit better. But let's, let's show you what the rest of the country is doing, and I'll tell you about the rest of the country that's doing nothing. They close their eyeballs. So it says there that the, the, the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. Well, what we'll prove to you today is that other evidence of strength is this. If I have a, connect, a tread that's got a, an existing bolt in it, rivet or square head, no evidence of rust, I want a guarantee from you. Will I get it from an engineer? I low test it, will I get an assurance? One is an opinion, one is an assurance, and you did what the law says, right? Who can get sued on that? If that bolt, if that original, uh, if that original bolt, which is 50 to 75 years, somehow fails two years later? I mean, there's going to be a court case, but what do they got? They got something out of the ordinary that was, wasn't supposed to happen. You take that same tread, and you now has rust growing into it. So you take the bolt out, you remove the rust, you put it back and you put a brand new bolt in there, do I need to load test a brand new bolt? Or do I have other evidence of strength for the, for the Portland Fire Department, as well as the rest of the nation? So now, two years later, that bolt shears. <coughs> Who goes to court? The bolt company. Because you're going to drag in all the players. Oh, and what happened? Was it a failure? Or was it a... Um, a, pro a product failure. And defect. Right, because did all the other ones shear? Or did they, did they use the right bolt? Well, let's say, assume all the right things are done. It was properly installed, properly torqued, grade five or grade eight, whatever you wanted to put in there. Nothing, out, no earthquake happened the night before. And, and that one bolt sheared. We have a, we have a, we have a, a court case, but who's, who's suing who? Everybody's going to sue who? The bolt manufacturer, right? So that's other evidence of strength. So in the United States, you change out every fastener on a fire escape, all major structural. Not minor, because you have some minor scrolls and stuff. All major structural gets swapped out with new fasteners, and all the connections are, are because of a confidence test. You are stating that every connection is free of rust. There is no rust in any of the connections, and you're willing to state that and sign off on it, and you put it on all brand new fasteners. 
What's the only thing left? Because you've already signed off on 97% of that structure. What's the only thing left? The wall. The wall. And now that we're going to 200 times, or 200 pounds, you have to verify the connection to the wall. Or if you want to leave sleeping dogs alone, what do you do? If you have a 50, 75, 100 year old building, don't touch it. What do you do? Next to that connection, what do you, what do you put in? A new epoxy bolt or a new through bolt. So that's the rest of the way, the way that the rest of the country is looking at it. Verify the connection, externally or internally, and we have ways, you know, drills to go in deep see if there's any rust. So we'll show you that. Or you duplicate, you leave the 100 year old building alone, you do what? Just duplicate the connection. If the wall cannot take any more plates or whatever, just put legs on the ground to it. What happens when you put a fire escape with legs all the way to the ground on Sonos? Both the rear and the front. What, do you, what have you done? Pre-standing unit. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's sidewalk. Well, sidewalk. <laughs> Guys, <It's okay. laughs> let's talk about people who get hurt on fire escapes. Ready? So, uh, as you can see, this is called live load testing. And, uh, and that's what a lot of people tell. Well, we had a bunch of people out there and it never fell. Yeah. A situation like this happened in, in, in Harvard Square where a piece of molding on the top there with all the students who always come out on these fire escapes to watch the parade down below. A piece of molding about 12 feet long fell, cast iron, you know, the cast iron people with everything, fell, and it came down like a javelin, and down below, what was there? People, and it hit where? Not here, it hit right next to it, but man, it scared the hell out of everybody. So, remember the days when there was no AC? Firefighters, what's this? You know, this is what all hell's breaking loose, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to get out, and what are you gonna use, the stairs inside? <clears throat> every time, that, every now and then, there's a medical evacuation, and what hurt? Well, who gets hurt? Not only the person getting evacuated, but the firemen using the treads that give way under them. And the last but not least, see this guy doing that work right there? That's a vendor working on a fire escape. Our Chicago vendor, uh, his name is Bill. His dad died. Tell seven stories. More or less my age, because he was changing one of these last bolts on the stupid thing, doing pretty much that, and he fell seven stories. Worse is the son had to go back and finish that fire escape. Think about that. So who does this affect? Everybody. Not just tenants. Here's another live load test. In the college towns, what do they do to get upstairs? How do you go visit your friends? Where do you go for a smoke? Right? Weddings are now on fire escapes. Hey, let's get in the back and hang on the fire escape. Right? And students who can't smoke in the building. <coughs> where do they smoke? Where do they light their candles, their incense? Right? So this is live load testing. Oh, let's talk about almost death load testing. This is a building in Massachusetts where five people were getting on. This is condos. The guy who turned this into condos, he and his son put on a new roof, lifted all the fire escapes, and what happens with any good mechanic when you have bolts left over? What do you do? Don't bother your Yeah, I, I can make this thing run smoother. So he checked those. So five people, condos, there was a real estate agent, a buyer, a seller, and a rent agent, and one of the condo people, five people went up there to basically talk about, I'm taking a fire escape picture from my fire escape that looks like that, and there's another fire escape right over there. Five people fell from there, and they thank God there was a roof below just about 10 feet. So what happens when you get chunks of fire escape falling on you, and you still have a good cell phone on you? What's the first thing you do? What do you call? Oh, why don't you call your lawyer to call 911 for you? <laughs> and you wait there for the photographs. Because that's what happened on this. This thing got into litigation like you wouldn't believe. And, and basically, all the three fire kids were no longer attached to the roof. They slid up. They were all sliding off the roof. Another crippling low test. This is over here in Iowa. So three students were watching fireworks on 4th of July up there. The fire escape, when they were, they, what happened was the, the, vend, the vendor had, uh, the owner of the building who owns like 40 of these buildings, you know, uh, with a lot of students in it, he had to fix one of the windows, one of the siding. So he took off the fire escape, not him, but the, the contractor took off the fire escape, which was through bolted, fixed the siding in the window, then lag bolted it back into the building through the same through bolt holes. And when the three kids are up there, the two guys and a girl, they all went boom, boom. Blood on the ground, that's the fire escape on the ground. And here's the smoking gun. 
because there was a, an incident that occurred and we didn't get to, to go look at this case till almost a year plus later, they preserved the evidence. This is Farscape CSI. Okay? They preserved the evidence in, the, in a quality controlled area, which was basically eight blocks down in a, in a grassy field. But when we went there to the grassy field, now this is fire, fire officials, lawyers, everybody. And what do we find? So it's not just thrown in the field. You know what I'm saying? So we start grabbing pieces, and then we find the smoking gun. We find that they had lax screwed back into the building. Through the hole, that could be a through hole. So the lawyers are all happy that they found the smoking gun. Somebody's going to lose millions of dollars. So. So this is what happens when they put it back. They put the fire escape back, they were so unsure of themselves, they not only threw both of the back of the building, they put a leg on it onto the roof. Onto a pressure treated sleeper? Now, nah, right into the shingles, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> there was, it was just, you know, so Mickey Mouse just, but you know, uh, and that corner right there, which all fell to the ground, was black screwed into the corner. When I went there, it still wasn't black screwed into the corner. I could actually pick up that bottom, walk it out two feet, and then walk it back. And again, we videotaped that, so. This case was quickly settled. Let's talk about a dead load test. Boston, a woman, five stories up. Because it's on a hill, this building, its fifth story is eyeball with the, the roof of the next building. And what do they have on that roof? Beautiful deck, high end area of Boston. You were there with your girl. It's nights, two in the morning, three in the morning. You want to have your last night cap, you go over there. You have. Half, half in the bag a little bit, the phone rings, and what does she offer? And she doesn't even live there? She offers to get the phone, but she doesn't know how to walk back, how to jump. The deck up there on this roof, and because the railing is missing, she, <whistles> boom. Now that one didn't make it. Missing pieces. You like this one? This is a live low test. This is a 50 unit complex. This just happened last year. You like this one? That's an eight-year-old child. When's the last time you guys have taught an eight-year-old child? Might yeah, just. Go. Yeah. But right now, firefighters are taking out the and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night, when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape. Smoke swirling around them. They said that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in their fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Uh, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. About a fire fire There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson. I'll see the Bridgeport. News 8. So, if you might just turn on the back light there. Here's the, uh, here's the question. 50 people were stuck on a fire escape. 50. <laughs> and all the ladders didn't come down on all the fire escapes. But it was a lucky day because they only lost one apartment and they let everybody back into their apartments even though none of the ladders are working on this fire escape. So when the firefighters arrived, was this a firefight or a rescue mission? Rescue, rescue first. What, what does the fire do while you guys are playing rescue? So this is what's happening. You've got all these cantilevers and ladders that are not even functioning. Because what is the fire escape for? For you to come there and help me out? Or is it for self-evacuation? And when you guys get there and a the cantilever or a ladder is in a down position, what do you use it for? Access. You don't have to wait to go three to five minutes to get a ladder. You give a fire three to five minutes. What does the smoke do to its occupants in three to five minutes? Yeah, just turn it back into a rescue mission, right? After you're done, you have to go in and, get, and do what with the people? It's a recovery. I'm sorry, it's called recovery, right? Okay? You don't have to hurry anymore. You just kind of stop fighting because in three to five minutes, you don't got much left. All right, who inspects fire escapes? The International Fire Code 2012 has made it very clear, design professionals or others acceptable to the building official. So if states want to start offering licenses like they do for, you know, for plumbing and electrical, and they haven't, okay, 
So are those acceptable to the building officials going to be people that are in that, in, that, in that field? Or they always say engineers. Some states say it has to be a structural engineer. Some states say anybody with it. You can have a civil engineer sign off on this thing. As long as you have engineers somewhere in your, somewhere in your stamp, it's, we're good. Architects, they're called design professionals. They're signing off on these fire escapes. City officials, everybody now and then says, you know, Stu already signed off on my fire escape, I'm fine. He already said everything was good. Or, You're just here for a formality. I tell them, no, they never inspect. They find violations, and they find one thing that caught their eye. We're here to catch the other nine things that he didn't have time to see. But they think you guys sign off on these fire escapes. Fire escape inspector. Those are people that are, have a license in Boston. It's a G3 license. In California, it's a Reg 4 license. You tell what California makes you do. Uh, you have to pay a thousand bucks. You have to pass a hundred question test with at least an 80. You have to sit with a fire official that does a one-on-one -on -one with you. Then you have to go out and do a fire escape inspection. Every fire escape inspection in California is uh, under Reg 4. You must, must be witnessed. So two days prior to any inspection, we got to notify the uh, fire prevention, say, hey, I'm doing an inspection in such and such a place. And if they want to or not, they can visit. Then there's a full report that you have to fill out. And if you don't fill it out correctly, you don't pass the exam. And every three years, they ask you for another contribution. So if anybody wants a great program to copy to start licensing people here to be inspectors, Reg 4 in, in LA, they have to so just copy and paste. Got it? Don't reinvent the wheel. Reg 4. And they're probably the best at it as far as the examination. They're probably the best. Okay, guys, we're going to talk about opinions versus certifications. Does this fire escape pass or fail in your, in your quick observation? Looks bad. So uh, by the time you let rust basically take over your entire fire escape surface-wise, what is every connection? Suspect or not? So as soon as every connection is suspect, you have a problem because who's willing to sign off on something that you've let rust for at least 25 years? Because that's how long it takes for you to lose all the paint off your fire escape on average. A metallurgist will show you and tell you that, that that's the average for, depending on what side of the building you're on, with time, what, whether it gets sun or rain or not, it'll, it'll basically eat up all your, all your paint. The reason I got called, and that's me doing an examination, is that an engineer had signed off on this saying, hey, fix two things. The reason why there was a violation is that a, there was a, a, a call at night, the police went up there to check a door on this, uh, on this building in Fort Lee, which used to be the East Coast equivalent of Hollywood for the, the silent movies. And this is where they had all their, they, this is basically in a warehouse now, but this was a studio, three or four or five story studio, and all the silent movies was held in there. But now it's just a big old storage warehouse. And so on, the, on one of these floors, one of the treads fell, so they says, he says right on his exam, He said on his exam, fix the tread, there's a bent piece of grating, and give it a paint job, and I'll sign off on it. You know who called me to go examine this? The secretary. The secretary who hired somebody to come and look at it says, I don't think he did a good job. When we went there, we found all of these problems. That's how tall it is. We found all these issues. So who's right? An inspector who looked at it or an engineer that, that, that examined it? It's not who's right or who's wrong. Was there a standard of inspection? There is no standard of inspection anywhere in the U.S. The, only, the first confidence test, there wasn't any in here. We worked with Seattle. We did a confidence test, basically, which is a yes, no question. Not an opinion that comes from engineers. Now it's, is all the treads free of any internal rust? Is all the connections on the rails free of any internal rust? And so it's a checklist item. What does Portland have done? Our visual inspection guide. Which is basically a, a questionnaire that says, are you doing, so in Seattle, they came up from, they used our questions and they created, so if you go on seattle.gov, they have on there, and you have it on here inside your book, this is the confidence test from Seattle. We use this as a model because we help build it with Seattle. Let's see if this has a the confidence test here. It's right here. So if you go to seattle.gov, Tacoma.gov, 
And you go on to fire prevention and you go to fire escape affidavits or certificates. And they, by the way, if you want to steal a bunch of certificates online, Seattle.gov, they have all these things for sprinklers. So basically copy and paste. Don't reinvent the wheel, it already exists. So we use this nationwide. All we do is they'll give it to you in PDF. They'll give it to you in Word, and what do you do? And I've done this, I did one for you guys. I basically just took out, I put Portland up here. I took the, the word in, I just did Portland uh, Fire, and we sent the U.S. for, not for approval, but to say, hey, use this as, a, as an example, because here is a state that already has one online, so it's an industry standard documentation. There's another one in Chicago. I went to look at this job in Chicago, and the, the an engineer basically had a report, which when I questioned the engineer on it, the owner, does he want the $3,000 repair or the $25,000 repair? This, this, I think, had about 150 apartments with the same fire escape system here. But instead of having brackets down below, it had the diagonal brackets from above that came down as a rod, fed down, and then bolted in and held, and then basically held the outside of the brackets. Right? So I went there to look at it to get my information to make sure that the structural, and this is what I found. Because the guy said this, the fire escape is not too bad. If you read the report, the fire escape is not too bad. Scrape it, change a couple of bolts and give it a good paint job, we'll sign off on it, right? Huge liability, right? This is what I found. The rods coming down were all eaten, bolts I could pull out with my fingers, look at the rods. And when I brought this to their attention, the management company, who's protecting their tail, to, to the ownership, you think the management company wants to bring this to the ownership that says, oh, by the way, you've been getting snookered all these years, we don't have a $50,000 problem or a $100,000 problem. We have a $350,000 problem because we got 15 of these all around the building. And they're in the state of collapse. So the examination process must be standardized because what are we trying to give the, what are we trying to, to give the, the city? If you spot repair this fire escape, what does this automatically trigger? You leave behind one square bolt, one rivet, What's the, what's the word that every fire inspector is going to pull out of their pocket? What's the card? Low test. Low test. To get what? Assurance, right? Not insurance, not guaranteed. They want assurance. So you leave behind the bolt on a major structural. Every official here and throughout the U.S. is now being trained to what the NFL.